Great. Uh, so there's a quick link. Oh, I was going to put this in Slack. Press enter. There we go. Uh, so C clock filtering, uh, that links in Slack. If, if anyone wants to open it, it has all the little code samples I'm about to get into. Um, give people another couple of seconds to figure out that link and I'll get right into it. So, so why filter logs? So this, it was funny, right after I joined Correlate, one of the first customers I helped, you know, was having some problems getting all the logs into their seam. We got that fixed and then it broke. So this is a problem that a lot of people have, right? Everyone wants Zeek, they want the Zeek logs, they want all the data, but sometimes unfortunately there's just too much data, right? You, you like the data that you get, but some subset of it is too much. And what I was hate to see is you, you'll, uh, I've a number of times heard comments like, oh yeah, we, we don't put the, the con log into Splunk or such because it's too big. Right, and that's always a shame because there's often useful information in there and not using a log at all because it's too big is, is always a, a terrible. So, Zeek has tons of really neat things you could do for log filtering and this was actually the hardest slide to figure out in the presentation. I was coming up uh, and trying to summarize all the different things that you can do, right? Well, you can filter logs or what does that mean? It, it turns out there's this huge array of things that you can do. You can remove fields, you can modify fields, you can remove lines, you can keep lines but put them in a different place. And then across all of this, uh, I'll get into what I call static filtering and dynamic filtering, which really takes advantage of some of the things you can do in Zeek because it's a full programming language. So to get right into it, I have some very complicated graphics. Uh, I figured, using actual logs would be a little hard to see. So with a bunch of these examples, I have green stuff and red stuff. So for all these examples, the green stuff is the stuff that you'll probably want, and the red stuff is the stuff that you might not want. So uh, yeah, picture these are multiple log lines, and you have a column, right, that you just never use. It's noise, you never report on it, or potentially it's, it's a useful field, but maybe someone had some privacy concerns, and you don't want to get rid of the entire log, you want the log, but you don't want one column, you just want it to go away. So what do you do? So uh, the logging framework has this built right in uh, as part of the log filtering, and the magic thing that you need to know to make this work is exclude. So you can change the logging filters and add a column, one or more columns to the exclude set, and Zeek will not write these to the logs anymore. And there's also, if you, I don't have an example for it, but if you want to only include like five fields, you can explicitly set include to those five fields and you will get those, oops, those five fields. So what does this look like? So I have my first little example in that repository, uh, column filter. So you can see, I'll make this bigger. So here's that same script. So, and I have little examples. So this is all set up so you can just run this as long as you have Zeek working. So if I run before, we will see we have the HTTP log with the host method and the URL. And if I run the after script where we exclude the URI, the URI is now gone. We still have the method and the host, but we no longer have the URI. And that's just a subset if you look at the HTTP log. We still have the full HTTP log with all the columns except that one. So pretty much as basic as you can get, remove some fields that you don't want, leave everything else the same. Now, this is where it starts getting a little more complicated. And this was something that up until recently was very difficult to do. And this is, you only want to remove some of the columns some of the time, right? Not what the previous example did, which just unconditionally gets rid of it. This time, we want to apply some logic and uh, remove a field only some of the time. So now with log policies, uh, which I'll get into because they're so flexible, half the examples use log policies, you can add some logic. You can say, well, if, if there isn't a URI and uh, a host, you know, just don't do anything anyway because it didn't exist. And then you could see, well, if, if for this example, if AVG is in the host, then get rid of the URI. So and I can show how that works, oops, real quick, in the example, so that's example two here, HTTP column removal, and here is that same script, 
same exact thing I have in the slide. So with our before, we have the same, same log as before where we see the host method URI. And you see with this AVG example, we have this URI. And this comes up, uh, I've helped some customers do this and s some people where they're doing TLS inspection. And once you start doing TLS inspection, you potentially start getting things that you really don't want to log. You might have your uh, internal authentication server and you, you realize you're logging passwords and you don't want to do that. So you want to conditionally start getting rid of things. So with that same script, now we run after and we'll see we have all the data, but for AVG hosts, that field has been cleared out. And we have just conditionally removed fields. So very interesting. Now, building on this, sometimes you don't completely want to remove it, you want to censor it. So you can see with a very, very small modification here, instead of deleting the field, we can substitute, uh, basically replace any character with X's. And if we run that real quick, 03, we see we have our remove script, same script. And I'll just show the results. But in this case, now we're getting the URL changed to be X's. And you can see it's, it's doing it dynamically, so longer URLs have more X's, stronger, shorter URLs have less X's. So that's uh, not just, you know, just replacing with X's. And this, there's a couple of things you could do with this. You could censor things. Um, I have a script I wrote similar for the TLS inspection. We want to, uh, if, there, if it does look like there's a password, just replace the password with something like X's or just replace it with the word censored. So you're, you're not removing all the data, but you're at least hiding some stuff that you know you don't want to see. Um, and yeah, this, this unlocks tons of capabilities. So uh, moving right along. So moving, moving from columns to lines, uh, a lot of times you have a log file that's very, very big, and there's a clear subset of the data that's just noise. You, you know uh, it can be very noisy. So what you want to do is, you, but you still want all the records, right? So what you want to do is route all the good log entries to one file and put all the noise in another file. And once you have that, you can do very interesting things like, send the normal file, say, to Splunk, and send the noisy file to your, you know, NAS, where you just archive it for six months, um, or just don't send it anywhere, you know, that, that sort of thing. Uh, this lets you get a lot more use out of, say, uh, a seam that either has, you know, licensing costs or performance considerations. So how do you do this? So similar to before, where we use the exclude log filter feature, here we use pathfunk. And there's a thing we have to do, very, very kind of boilerplate. We remove the default filter, we add our new filter, and then we implement this function. And effectively, whatever this function returns is now the name of the log file. So very common use for this sort of thing is, is for noise, right? So if we have a scan, we want to send the scan to a con scans log, and we send everything else to the con log. So what does this look like in practice? So it should be 04, you know, route scans. So we run this PCAP before, so we get 1,122 con entries, and because I don't have the script yet, zero for con scans. With the script, we've moved 67 entries to the con scans log. And if we look at con scans, uh, you can see the histories, I guess that's not formatting as nice, but it's, it's all syn packets and syn packet resets, so zero service, just all noise, all scans. And depending on where you have Zeek in your environment, if it's before a firewall that, you know, is basically seeing the internet fire hose of scans, this can be upwards of 50% of your con log. I've, I think I've seen upwards of 80% on a, on a public network that was, you know, Zeek was before the firewall. So if, you know, you want to reduce potentially 80% of your log going to your seam, this type of thing is perfect. Um, and the great thing about this is since you, you've routed it to a different log file, you potentially still have the data, right? You've never, you've never deleted any logs. If you did have an incident where you have to investigate, you could still archive this file somewhere else. So definitely uh, better potentially than just removing it outright. Uh, a, a very interesting variation of this is where you want to leave the original log alone. 
but you want to send some subset to another log file. And this, there's, there's a ton of reasons why you might want to do that. You might have like a researcher that's interested in a certain subset of data and you want to provide them just, just the logs that they're, they're interested in. You don't want to give them the full set of data. Alternatively, I made uh, use of this for years. I had uh, the HTTP log filtered to just executables, right? And where I didn't necessarily have a ton of storage to store the HTTP log indefinitely, I didn't want to ever miss an executable. So there was just, there's like HTTP executables log. Um, so the way we do that, again, similar uh, log filter. The one difference is we do not remove the default filter, right? We don't want to mess with the stock config. We just want to add a new scan only policy and that has very similar logic. We have a scan only policy that breaks if it's not a scan. And what do we get if we run that? So that's 05. Uh, so again, so the before, we should have that same 1022. The difference now, and we'll be able to see the difference, is the after, we didn't change the con log at all. That's still the exact same log file, but now we have this subset uh, where we've moved scans. And in a lot of these examples, I use scans just because everyone probably has scans. It's very easy to find a PCAP that has scans. But this works for anything, not just scans. You could use this for any of the logs for really any purpose whatsoever. Um, and then, so moving forward even more. So sometimes you really don't want to route it to another log file. Like for scans, you just want them gone. You don't want the disk I.O. You don't want to send it to your seam. You're never going to look at Hi, it. Boaz, really just this is James. I I'm going to be uh, running the Zoom for you. And uh, so I know we've got that presenter that going right now. Uh, you will be, uh, uh, you will be him books, right after we're uh, on, right after him. Way, if uh, if you could go live for us, so we can just take a look at your slides, make sure that everything is looking good on your end. They're always there. You can add as many policies as you want, and uh, any you policy can just veto any log file. So this, you know, becomes the whole script. We don't have to do any log filtering. We just define the log policy. We say yes, I can. If the history was one of these two things break and it doesn't work. Ah, so let me start my video as well. That example, real quick. Okay. So you see, this is the entire script. Like if you threw this in your local .zeek and you know redeployed, you would no longer have scans. So we can see the before. We should have. Okay, so I just shared my slide. Could you let me know if you can see that? We have 1064, and you see the histories, the S and the SR are no longer present. They should be about there, and they're gone. So super easy to do. Again, works for any log file, any, if there are certain records that you know you just don't want and want to get rid of, you can just do that, and it's very easy. And <laughs> Sorry. The reason why log um, if you can communicate so with me just through the chat, because we're because getting your audio on the expression. recording. Right. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> not, um, but I see your slides, everything's just, looking good. Um, a certain we'll be able to hard coded swap feature to you is really is literally any expression that you could come up with that could return true or false, any logic that you could envision, you can use in a hook. And the other really neat thing with hooks is they stack. So these two separate hooks are exactly identical to the one hook. So you could have one hook. Uh, you know, filter out a certain records and then a second hook filter out even more and they won't conflict. This was something that was very difficult with the pred function because you could only have one. With the hooks, you can you uh, envision you could have this package, you know, con filter scans. And then maybe someone else, you want to load another package, you know, con filter, you know, DNS. And you could load both of them at the same time. They could each veto a log entry and you're not going to have conflicts and you know both can run it'll just run one after the other so yeah it's it's very interesting so another example uh, of one of the you know things you could do with con log policies you could say for any connection that Zeek identified as DNS where both the originator and responding packets was you know basically one or two uh, don't log it. And the reason why you might want to do this is because, well, the DNS log is most likely going to have this. It's going to say what the query was, what the answer was, the TTL. The, the con log itself on top of that doesn't really provide that much useful information. But we're being smart about it because say someone was 
running a VPN over port 53 and they transfer 10 gigabytes over port 53, well, that's going to be more than two packets and you're still going to have the con log entry. And this actually makes it even more useful because then if you do have con log entries that say, you know, port 53, you're going to probably wonder why is it showing up. I'm, I'm filtering those. You know, anything left in your con log is likely not going to be, you know, normal DNS. And one of the reasons, uh, again, this why this is super cool is this is not really possible to do with like a BPF filter, right? Because what would your BPF filter be, right? Port 53. Well, if you try filtering port 53, your DNS log is gone, right? So there's a lot of things that you can do with the log filtering that you can't do at other levels of the stack, right? You need Zeek to process all the data, figure out what everything is, then make your log filtering decisions at the very end. Um, and I forget if my next example, I might not have had an example. Oh, I do. Confilter DNS. So we have that, oops, that's my T sticks. Uh, that same script, and you can see we run before, we have 1122con, 1328dns, and afterwards, there's, you know, a couple hundred filtered. I think the biggest thing in this PCAP is actually NetBIOS, which is why it doesn't filter as much, but still, you know, that's a quarter about of the con log that you're able to get rid of. So, a, a pretty simple thing to do that can have a big impact on your, you know, data volumes. So, as I mentioned a couple of slides ago, since that, the, the log policy can use any Boolean expression, you can start getting into some pretty advanced things uh, using more Zeek features, like say you have some researchers on your network that do internet scanning. I know there's a, a couple of institutions that do things like this where they do, you know, internet-wide research. I think like ICSI was doing this for a while and if you're logging connections from this host, you're gonna have a very bad time because they're just blasting out packets across the internet. Um, but instead of hard coding it, you can define a set of uh, subnets, put your address in there, and then in your policy, you can say if that host is in that set, don't log it. And where this gets interesting is because Zeek is so flexible, that set doesn't just have to be hard coded, right? You can, you can hard code it or you could load it from a file using the input framework, or you could load it uh, from a config file using an option, which can, if you have, if you have one of these, input framework is pretty straightforward. If you wanted to have, say, 50 different sets, the config framework is a much simpler option uh, to look into. And the, the nice thing is the policy stays exactly the same. It's just where that data comes from is now coming from a file that you could update you know, by pushing it out, or if you have like a really nice uh, host database, like some sort of CMDB that you can scrape data from and build Zeek input files, you can have this dynamically update as hosts are, you know, tagged as say research scanner. Um, and then Zeek will just update on the fly. Um, so everything up until now has been kind of what I alluded to at the beginning called static filtering, right? We're defining this stuff ahead of time. We're saying we don't want this, and when we see this, we don't log it. But Zeek is much more flexible than that. Uh, because Zeek has all the logic, all the state tracking, tables and sets, you can start getting pretty advanced. Uh, so a couple of times I proposed doing something like filtering scans. And a response is often, well, we don't want to filter the scans because we'll want to know if something is scanning. Um, but a really cool thing that you could do is what I call the hybrid approach. If you say load uh, my simple scan package, that maintains as part of its functionality a set called known scanners. And using this, what you could do is set your scan policy or set your log policy to be, well, if the originator host is sending a scan packet and it's in the known scanners, don't log it. And the reason why this is pretty cool is as a host starts scanning, you will get all the, the con log entries until the scan notice is raised and then you don't get any more con logs. And why this is neat is you could very easily have uh, 65,000, 130,000 uh, con log entries for a scan. You know, if your organization has a slash 16, 
And most likely you don't want 65,000 call log entries every time someone scans the network. If you have your scan threshold set to 50, you'll get 50 or so and then it will stop. And that's kind of like the best of both worlds. You get all the raw data until it's clear that it's a scan and then you kind of save your uh, seam ingest by not getting flooded with, you know, if, if you have 50 scan attempts, is there really any additional value to getting 128,000 scan attempts? Not, not really, usually. Uh, and uh, my final example is, I wanna go through fully, uh, this is another really cool thing that you could do, uh, which is spammy DNS. There's lots of applications, lots of hosts that just love to just break and start flooding your DNS resolver with say thousands of queries a second for the same name. And at some point you just don't want to log that. Uh, where I used to work uh, at NCSA, we, we had you know, this supercomputer with you know, 20,000 nodes and you could imagine if, if they were trying to do a DNS query for something that didn't exist, multiplied you know, across the entire cluster, it's a lot of noise. So we can do our, our filtering, uh, our splitting, but starting to take advantage of more Zeek filters, we can add some tables and some sets, right? We're gonna track our recent queries. We just want the count of queries. And then once we detect something is spammy, we're gonna put in a penalty box, spammy queries. Pretty, pretty straightforward. And then to make this work, you know, we're gonna do our function. First check that we have a query, just some boilerplate stuff. And then this is the whole thing. We, we take our query, we increment the recent queries. If the result is more than 500, we flag that as a spammy query. And then if it's a spammy query, that's the uh, log file that we send it to. And I could show this working, it's pretty cool. Uh, so here's our DNS flood. So before we run this, we have, uh, I have this PCAP with 2,500 DNS queries and it's, it's very boring. It's exactly the kind of thing. It's just example.com 2,500 times in a very short time frame. Uh, exactly the kind of thing that can very easily blow up uh, your seam. Uh, with the, the script running, we get 500 exactly, because this is running in standalone mode, into the DNS log, and then it routed everything else into spammy. And we can do a similar thing. If you didn't want to route it, you can do an even simpler script with the hooks. So again, this is, this is the entire thing to just define some tables, increment some counters, check some things. And here, the before should have the 2500 and the after, we only get 500. And this is using, you know, pretty large amount of Zeek features all at once because it's pretty con concise um, and has a, a pretty good impact of your DNS. If, if you do have a host that kind of goes haywire, starts flooding your DNS servers, it'll stop logging after it sees 500 queries in a minute. Um, so yeah, that was my slides. I know it's going very fast. Uh, I think hopefully people learned something, or at least uh, things that you might not have realized you could do. Hopefully now you know that you can do them. And if you need the examples, uh, I do want to sync up with the documentation team and make sure, I believe most of these are documented, but it's not always obvious why you might use some of these features or that you can combine them in interesting ways. Um, so hopefully soon the, I'll work to get the docs updated to make sure that every single one of these features is super obvious and documented with a use case like this. So any, I think I have a couple minutes if there's any questions. Any questions for Justin? Hi. Oh. Uh, would you use these tricks to do summarization logs too? Um, you could, technically, yeah, you could, in, in this, in the hooks for the log policy, you actually get all the logs. So you could use that as a very easy entry point to access all the data uh, build it into a table and then as things expire, log a summary. So yeah, you could, there, there's so many different things that you could use uh, the log policy hooks for. Uh, first, thanks for a, a really nicely done talk and really clearly showing off the various capabilities. 
um, as I was um, chewing on this, I was thinking it's, it's in some situations you're just going to throw away a bunch of stuff. And then it's kind of a pity you do all the work to get to, mm. hey, it's a log, and now I'm going to throw it away. <clears throat> and I was, I was toying with, you know, if event handlers were hooks, then you could define a high priority event handler that mm. says, oh, this, this is the researcher, just break. Mm. I don't want any more event processing for it. And I'm not sure that would fully work, but I'm wondering if you have any reflections on it. Yeah, it's, it's almost a similar problem, like I mentioned with the BPF filtering, where sometimes you really don't know that you don't want something until it's done. Yeah, I'm not saying you would use it instead of it. It would be oh, yeah. another tool in the toolbox. Yeah, no, that is, it is interesting. Because, yeah, the log, we used to have a log event thing, and it was an event. And the challenge there is the event would run after the log was written, and you couldn't, like, uh, this slide, uh, come on, uh, this type of thing where you modify the event, you, you couldn't hook in, right? That's why hooks are called hooks. You, you could see what the URI was, but you couldn't affect it. Um, and, right, because, as you know, behind the scenes, events and hooks are almost the same thing anyway. So, yeah, that could open some interesting capabilities to... Yeah, say that, yep, this event is not interesting, stop. Yeah, another, there used to be a misfeature, it may have been fixed or not, where the event handler, if it changed the value of one of the parameters, it, the others saw that. And, and here you could do that, for example, hey, I, I don't know what other HTTP analysis is going to go on, but I don't want any of it seeing this password, so I'm just going to change it. Hmm. Yeah. Excellent. I expect Justin will have proof of concept code written for that. <laughs> oh, no. I, I, these days, honestly, I'm more of the idea person. Like, I, I think, Christian, you implemented all of this, I think. I, I was like, what if we did this? And that's my role kind of these days is, is, what if we did this? And Christian or Tim or someone just makes it happen, and then I get to talk about all the cool things that you could do now. Absolutely. Uh, um, we are ready for our next speaker, so uh, sure. please join me in thanking Justin for our <laughs>